Welcome to Confidently Insecure, the podcast where we are absolutely sure we don't know everything. And boy, oh boy, is this a topic that I have been asked for over and over again ever since I mentioned it on our sex workers episode. Uh, I am so excited to introduce our guest today. She might be the most official uh, guest we've ever had, uh, the the most insightful, definitely the one with the most degrees for sure. Uh, I'd love to introduce our guest for this week. This is Terry Warren. You are a R-N-A-N-P, the owner of Westover Heights Clinic in Portland, Oregon, a private clinic that specializes in the diagnosis and treatment of sexually transmitted diseases. Hi, Terry. Thanks so much for being on the podcast this week. Most welcome. Happy to be here. So uh, you've been doing this for over 20 years, and your specialty is in herpes simplex. So this is kind of an episode of talking about herpes. <laughs> right. Actually, 35 years now. But Oh, wow. Okay. I must have an old bio. <laughs> Maybe. It's over 20 years, that's for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, I want to talk a little bit, too, about how the work that you do, it says here you've been the principal investigator uh, or sub-investigator on over 60 clinical trials involving genital herpes, new medication, new testing devices, and new vaccines. Correct. Correct. So your whole life has just been filled with herpes. <laughs> it has. My whole life has been filled with herpes since 1982. How do you get into this uh, this side of, of health? You know, when I was in, um, so I, I went to school and got a bachelor's in psychology, went back and got a master's in counseling. Didn't really enjoy that process on a daily basis, full time. Seemed like it took a long time for people to feel better. So I decided to go back and go to nursing school. I was about to be a single mom. And I thought, I really want a career that I can always have a job to support my girls. So I went back to nursing school and uh, met a microbiologist at the medical school. Um, started dating. His specialty was gonorrhea. So we ended up going to a whole bunch of conferences about sexually transmitted infections. And it really... Um, piqued my interest and it fit well with my educational background in terms of counseling. So you mentioned counseling. Is there, um, would you say, like an emotional aspect of your work that you have to learn how to do too? Or is it all, you know, science and Petri dishes? I would say um, that the majority of it is, is the counseling piece. I think the other big part is getting a correct diagnosis so the physical clinic that I owned um, closed three years ago, and what I did was extend it into a research group. So now we're doing research specifically on certain aspects of herpes. So I can do that from anywhere. We're actually up in Maine right now on vacation, but I can, can do this from anywhere. And I think a huge component of what I do is counseling people who are upset about this diagnosis or upset about the way the diagnosis was handled, upset about the way they're going to have to deal with future sexual relationships. So the background in counseling comes in very early. Uh, so I want to kind of start from the very basic bare bones beginning. We have about listeners as young as 15 all the way up to 30. And I feel like someone, myself as like a pretty sexually active woman who has been, you know, I think I got chlamydia the second person I ever slept with. And I was like, oh, this, the STDs are no big deal. Yet I feel like our society and, um, our age group is still so, um, undereducated about it. So if you don't mind, if we go back to just the very basics of like, what is herpes? <laughs> herpes simplex virus. There are, there are eight herpes viruses. Eight? There are eight human herpes oh. viruses. Um, one causes chicken pox. Um, there are a couple that cause rashes in children. Um, there's one associated with HIV infections. So, but I think we're going to talk today about herpes simplex type 1 and 2. Mm -hmm. And they are very much the same, but they're also different from each other. They share a lot of common parts of their DNA, but they are also 
different in certain ways. Traditionally, we've thought of HSV-1 as causing cold sores on the lip. That's not canker sores, different. Mm-hmm. Cold sores are not canker sores. Herpes does not cause canker sores, but it does cause recurrent cold sores. So traditionally, HSV-1 has been thought of in that way. HSV-2 traditionally thought of as genital infection, where people get blisters, ulcers, scabbing, uh, and that recurs genitally. However, Mm. with changing sexual practices, a lot more oral sex involved um, in sexuality now, we are seeing a cross between the two viruses. So we're seeing a lot of HSV-1 genitally, not much at all HSV-2 orally. They have what are called site preferences, places they like to be. HSV-1 really prefers the mouth, but it can pretty easily live in the genital area, though it doesn't recur much there. HSV-2 has a very strong site preference for the genital area and is rarely oral, but it can be. Now, why is that? I mean, do they look the same? Let's say if you have HSV-1 in your genital area, is it going to look like HSV-2 or do they look different? What's really the difference if they're kind of coexisting? They don't look any different. You cannot tell by looking at I remember speaking with a physician one time. I'm a nurse practitioner, a master's in nursing, and sometimes um, physicians have difficulty with my credibility as a nurse practitioner. But I remember speaking with a physician one time talking about the importance of typing all swab tests that go out. If they're positive, ask if it's type 1 or type 2. And he said, oh, I never do that. You can definitely tell by looking if it's type 1 or type 2. And I said, oh, really? What? 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 Tell me what you see that's different. He said, well, with type 1, you just get one lesion. And with type 2, you get multiple lesions. Like, nope, that's not the way it is. But um, Someone needs to take his degree. <laughs> they, um, they look exactly the same. You can't tell except by a laboratory test. So, I mean, you mentioned testing, and I was going to save this question for later, but let's just talk about it now. I feel like testing has a lot of questions around it. Um, I know for me, I've been getting tested since I was sexually active, but this was back in the you know early 2000s, mid-2000s, and I've heard stories from people who say that they had to specifically ask for a herpes test. It's not considered to be in your standard STI, STD panel. Is that true? Because I feel like when, you know, someone who maybe not be as educated goes in to get tested, they're thinking they're getting the whole gamut. You're absolutely right. And it's not without a whole lot of controversy. I don't think that I necessarily agree with other colleagues of mine in terms of testing. But when our clinic was open, we didn't do an STD screen without including herpes testing. In my mm-hmm. mind, if about 12% of the population has HSV-2 and about half the population has HSV-1, if people are asking about sexually transmitted infections, type 2 in particular, and we're not testing it, we're not testing them for it, and we're not telling them we're not testing them for it, they are assuming that they are being tested for one of the most common STIs around. So the issues with the test, there are a number of reasons why people don't test. I think the, probably the prime reason is it's not a terrific test. The, the one mm-hmm. that's generally available um, is good at picking up infection in people who are already diagnosed with herpes. But if you're using it as a screening test, it turns out that it's not that great. The test the, is called IgG. Not Instagram. Not to be confused with Instagram. <laughs> there is another test called IgM, which is a terrible test. Lots of false positives. The CDC says never to use it, and it's used all the time. So that's a whole different problem. But the IgG misses 30% of type 1 and 8% of type 2 as a screening test. So that's a, that's a, big, uh, that's a big whoopsie doozy we've got going on here. For, for type 1 in particular. Yeah. And you mentioned 50% of the population, almost 50%. A lot of it's oral. Some of it's genital. The test only tells you whether you have it or not, not where it is. And you can be a carrier or you can have it and go your whole life without showing symptoms? About 70% of people with type 1 don't have symptoms that they recognize. So this is crazy. (laughs) About 80% of people with type 2 have unrecognized infection. So... You you could potentially pick it up, go get what you think is STD testing for 10 years, 
than, you know, get married, settle down, have a family, have a um, an outbreak pop up and that could create some serious drama in a relationship because I think people's first minds go to, oh, you cheated. This is this dirty thing. And I don't think enough people know that chances are almost 50 percent you're carrying this thing around with you. And maybe you're the lucky one who just never gets it. But it also shouldn't be such a big, shameful, bearing weight to recognize that you do have it. And I think that, you know, we see a lot of HSV-1 mouth to genital transmission. That's the prime way that HSV-1 is transmitted is mouth to genitals. And that can happen when a person has no cold sores ever in their life, but they're shedding the virus, giving it off from their cells. And that also creates, you know, huge questions about who else have you been sleeping with? What did you not tell me? Um, and it, there's a whole big emotional impact with herpes. I think that's more than any other STI, sexually transmitted infection. So it's an issue. Absolutely. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that stigma because uh, my boyfriend had actually mentioned in a podcast episode earlier that it was, you know, big pharma and these antiviral companies that had actually created this uh, scare, you know, I'm doing this in air quotes, scare of herpes because they were trying to push their medication. Is that a myth? Yes. That's a myth. We had people being very stigmatized about herpes before there was ever medication. We only mm. had medication in 1982. <clears throat> so before that, if people had herpes, there was nothing you could do. And people right. were fully stigmatized, believe me. <clears throat> because just when I was coming into practice, we were just starting to get medicines, but people were just stigmatized then as well. I think the idea that big pharma is somehow either keeping um, a cure quiet. I've certainly heard people say that. They just want to mm. sell their drugs. So there's a cure, but they're just not telling us. I think that discredits all of us who do research. <laughs> I mean, it's like, really? Did we keep that? <laughs> no. Like you're holding this secret, you know, glowing purple vial, vial somewhere in a closet. <laughs> At least the, the secret. So everybody can have it. This is so right. silly. So, so. so when you saw back in the 80s, this kind of wave of medications and treatments being created, what were you seeing uh, uh, from patients and, and, and clients that you had? Um, what was their what was the emotional feeling around seeing that there's treatments? Cause I know like the AIDS crisis back then was, you know, this feeling of like no hope. And once you get it, it's like a death sentence. And, and, you know, now that we're you know, 20 years later, that's a very different narrative. But did you see uh, frightened, panicked patients? And, and, and have you seen that change? Or do you feel like the emotional toll is still the same of someone being diagnosed? I think before antivirals, and the first one was called acyclovir, a woman named Gertrude Ellian um, developed this medication. And she was a really interesting character. I met her twice uh, before she died. She won the Nobel Prize for this and other drugs that she developed, but she was master's prepared, which is really interesting wow. because there's that whole thing going on about that. But she was just a wonderful, wonderful scientist. So when acyclovir came, people who had dealt with herpes for years with no treatment were just so, so grateful. Then the next one was Valtrex, which is valacyclovir is now generic. And the, the difference is that valacyclovir can be taken once a day versus acyclovir, which had to be taken twice a day. They mm. work about the same when taken as directed, but that was a huge thing. And then came famcyclovir, which is a slightly different drug. They're all in the same class of drugs, and they all work about the same. There are some differences, um, but I think to have those available gives people a sense of empowerment. So we had that, and then we thought, well, people can take this medicine if they're not having outbreaks, all is well. It's a great new day. Except that then we discovered that people can give off this virus when they have no symptoms, called asymptomatic viral shedding. Wow. And that is the hardest thing, I think, about herpes, is that you can infect a partner at any time, and there isn't a day that you can say to them, I know that today I will not infect you. Wow. So that's a very challenging thing. We can usually deal pretty well with keeping outbreaks under control, 
but we can't eliminate shedding with the drugs that we have. We did a trial maybe four or five years ago of a drug coming out of Europe that was actually a lot better, um, but there were some uh, side effects noted in the animal models um, mm. in vision that the FDA discontinued the trial. But that mm. got that got shedding down to about two percent of days, where the ones that wow. we have are on average maybe seven percent of days. You mentioned animal testing. Can animals have herpes virus, or is this you guys are giving them? But this is something we're, we're giving them. We're giving them herpes. The guinea pig model is pretty good for looking at that. Got it. But animals naturally don't have herpes, except horses can have herpes, and I think there's a fish virus related to herpes. But you'll see that. There are horse horse stables that get shut down when a herpes virus comes in, but it's not what we're talking about. So interesting, interesting. Um, I want to go back a little bit to the testing. Um, you mentioned about false positives. Now, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it, the testing can be done by blood and swabbing. So you can diagnose somebody with herpes based on a couple of methods. Used to be visual inspection that's still really common. A clinician will look at somebody and say, oh, this is herpes. Not even do a swab, not find out if it's type one or type two. And we know that one out of five times in a study done, uh, the clinicians make a mistake and those were experienced STD clinicians. So that sucks and wow. the CDC says don't do that alone. <laughs> so then you're left with someone with symptoms and you can swab those symptoms. And the best swab test is called PCR. Uh, polymerase chain reaction, or it could be called NAT testing. Both of those are really the same, just looking for genetic material. The old mm -hmm. style swab was a culture where you gathered cells and then you put them in media and see if they uh, destroyed basically the media. And that is an old style, and is the new one's probably three or four times more sensitive. That is, it picks up more cases, three or four times more cases. So if somebody wow. does a swab, they want PCR or NAT testing. If there are no symptoms, that's when the blood test comes in. And the timing here is essential. If you, let's say you have sex with somebody and a week later you go to your clinician and you say, I want to test for all STIs. Well, it's way too early for the herpes test because the herpes test is looking for antibody, not virus itself. And virus is not in the blood. So antibodies, that, that is your body actually trying to fight the herpes from entering? So that can take anywhere from maybe two weeks to 12 weeks to be developed. It depends on the person. Wow. So you can't, it's not something you can do right away. We know by six weeks after infection, about 70% of people that are going to make antibodies will have done so. So six weeks is a kind of an okay time to get an idea about what's going on. Mm -hmm. It's not certain, like 12 weeks is. And there's nothing to do in that period of time? Like you kind of just have to cross your fingers that you do or don't have it? And and I say that being like, you know, we shouldn't be crossing our fingers. I'm trying to destigmatize it, yet here I am playing it like a lottery game myself. You're going to be in a period of wondering. And <clears throat> I think that the timing piece is very important. The one thing you can do to screw up the timing, well, there's a few things you can do to screw up the timing, but the one thing that you can do to screw up the timing is to take antiviral medicine before you have a diagnosis. If you take mm. antiviral medicine early on, the purpose of antiviral medicine is to reduce viral replication, reduce the number of virus particles that are around, but if you do that successfully, then your immune system can't see the virus and it doesn't make antibody. So don't be taking Valtrex. <laughs> or you have a diagnosis. Right. Got it. Because that can mess up your results. Can mess up your results. I, I, I wanted to ask too with the with the results. Um, I've actually dated someone with HSV one back in the day and when we went to the clinic together, the doctor had actually given me a prescription for... That was an error. Interesting, because I've, I've heard that from, from partners, too, saying like, oh, well, if your partner's taking it, you should also take it. That's not protecting you. That's not doing anything for you. Likely, if you became, if you were really negative and you became infected, uh, the dose that you would take on a regular basis would be insufficient to um, prevent you from becoming infected. 
So I, I'm just assuming that I probably have. Like, I've never had a cold sore before, but I'm assuming that I carry it. Um, <laughs> that's just a confession, not a question. Um, <laughs> um, I did also want to ask about with the blood test. Um, tell me if this is right or wrong. I remember this was a while ago, maybe seven or eight years ago. So maybe things have changed. I remember them saying that when they're testing the blood, they're looking for it to be over a certain number. Right. And if you're over a certain number, then you have it. And if it's under and it can be kind of close, you're safe. But that seems also incredibly inefficient or irregular like ooh, this time I only got a 0.6 I'm still good <laughs> so let's talk just about HSV2 here for a minute because that's generally the one that we're more concerned about so because HSV2 facilitates HIV entry and it mm -hmm. recurs a lot more genitally than type 1 so we'll talk just a minute about type 2 if you get a an antibody test and you've waited long enough for the test to be accurate and you get a what's called an index value of 1.1 .1 to 3.5, you get a number, uh, then you should get a confirmatory test. And this is what the Center for Disease Control clearly states in its STD treatment guidelines. Because half of those positives in 1.1 .1 to 3.5 are false positives. That's crazy. Half. Another <laughs> reason that some clinicians don't do this test, because the confirmatory test <clears throat> it's called the herpes western blot and it's done only at the university of washington and it's expensive and so i think that clinicians say well if i can't really trust this why do it at all right my feeling is it's possible to figure that out if patients want to know if they have herpes then you explain to them here's this test we're going to look at the index value if it's you know negative it's with 92% certainty, you probably don't have HSV2. If it's 1.1 to 3.5, we will order a confirmatory test. If it's greater than 3.5, there's a high likelihood that you are infected. Mm -hmm. However, I have tested people with an index value of 12. I have done a Western blot on somebody with an index value of 12, and it was a false positive. So now, wow. now what I'm saying, I mean, that's a tiny chance that that would happen, but this woman, I think it had one sex partner and they tested negative and she got a 12. She was from out of her native country was not the US and we do know that there are differences in, um, anyway, so I said, let's do a Western blot and she was negative by blot. That's something interesting you bring up uh, culturally too, just like your, your, where you live, is this, just a problem in America? Can you talk a little bit about geographically? For example, in Japan, HSV-1 genital infection has always been more common for a long time than HSV-2. So I think herpes is, you know, everywhere. It's not just here. Worldwide. It's, it's worldwide and we've known about it since I think 600 BC. Herpes means to creep and it was recognized way back then. So pharma wasn't around that's, then. That's funny you bring that up. I wanted to read just a little section from um, a Vice article, if you don't mind, from, uh, this was Brittany De La Cretes. In 2017, she wrote a really great article about herpes in media and like sort of the shame behind how we project this stuff in television movies. Um, so she said, uh, you know, uh, back in Romeo and Juliet, he wrote of the spread of oral herpes saying, or ladies lips whose straight on kisses dream, which oft the angry mob with blisters plagues because their breaths and sweet meats tainted are. <laughs> so Romeo was pretty poetic about herpes. Um, she, she also mentions uh, that uh, Jennifer Lawrence, when she was doing a Hunger Games press tour, she joked about, uh, because all of the co-stars were kissing in the movie, she said, oh, uh, you know, everyone got herpes. And then she said, sorry, it's not a joke. It's a, it's a disease that ravages the world, which is a dramatic statement, obviously. Uh, in Pitch Perfect, Rebel Wilson's character comforts Britney Snow's character about vocal nodules saying, at least it's not herpes, implying that the worst thing she could have is herpes. Uh, even on the more progressive shows, Brittany points out that even like John Oliver has compared herpes to terrorism. 
uh, on the Mindy Project, who she plays a doctor herself. She's even giving fear-mongering sex talks. Uh, we see it even in animated shows like Bob's Burgers. I mean, this is everywhere of us making fun of herpes being the worst thing that could happen. Everyone knows that famous line from The Hangover where uh, the dad says, you know, uh, not everything stays in Vegas. Herpes, that's the one thing that you can bring back with you. Uh, are we as entertainers perpetuating this stigma? I can't think of one show off the top of my head that doesn't, you know, sensationalize it or um, dramatic, dramatize it. I don't know if I said that word right. Um, I, I've never seen it handled truly and and real on a TV show. I can't think of anything. Is this our fault? Are we doing this? <laughs> well, I think that certainly contributes. And I think people tell jokes about herpes. And I have so many patients who said, you know, I've been in a social situation. I have herpes. Somebody makes a joke about herpes and I laugh right along because I worry if I don't laugh right along, they'll think it's me. So I think mm -hmm. we've got a long ways to go with stigma. I try to talk to people about the reality of herpes versus the perceived stigma. You know, it's, you can certainly control outbreaks, you can control shedding, but I think it's still difficult to, to tell people that you're going to have sex with, that you have this thing that they could acquire and that you cannot perfectly keep them safe. That you have mm -hmm. to enter into that relationship as a couple, knowing that there's a risk to be taken, you're agreeing to take it, and then if transmission occurs, you're still not happy about it, but at least it's something that you discussed ahead of time. And how much more emphasis do we need to put on the conversation around herpes versus other STDs and STIs? Because like you said, when you're about to have sexual intercourse with someone or even oral, I mean, this is a conversation that could potentially even happen before you kiss someone. I mean, if we're talking about oral herpes or, or mouth to mouth, um, are we not putting enough emphasis on that conversation in particular before sex? Because I know when I was in high school, we never talked about it. It wasn't until I had to educate myself. And I wonder if you know, people who are diagnosed, if they're able to kind of spout back some of these statistics the way that you are able to explain to me in, an, in a digestible format, it wouldn't be so overwhelming. I know that um, when my partner and I, you know, the partner that I'm referring to back in the day, and I had um, intercourse with a third partner, you know, he mentioned, this is what I have right before we did it. And it kind of like, took me by surprise and the person by surprise. And we, we were all kind of like, Oh, and then he f backed it up with, and here is my like pamphlet on why it's not as scary as you think. And in a weird way, we were comforted by that. I think it was not great timing. I mean, Jesus Christ, I couldn't think of a worse time to, to bring it up. It should have happened a lot sooner. I think that's really key is that you find a good time. And I talk to people a lot about that. I've, pl I've role played with my patients, all the different responses that they could get. You know, I've, I've, so I always pe tell people it's probably not a good time right before you have sex. Try to do it when you're just alone together, not in a public place because you, you might cry or somebody else might cry and you want to feel like you can feel what you feel and express that. But I, mm -hmm. I do stress it. Try to present it in a more matter of fact way practice with people that you like or in front of the mirror and say before we become sexual there's something I need to let you know I've been diagnosed with herpes type 1 or herpes type 2 um, for men condoms reduce transmission by 96% so Whoa. if you're a man you can tell your partner we're going to use condoms and I take daily antiviral therapy which reduces transmission by half so I'm doing these things I feel empowered by these tools that I have, but they're not perfect tools. And so I feel like if we're going to become sexual, we need to have some trust. And I trust you to tell you this personal thing about me. And I, I yeah. really encourage people to be careful about who they tell. Think that through really carefully. Perhaps get to know people longer before you have sex so that you get a feel for whether they can treat that information in a precious way. Or will they tell everybody they don't? Let me ask you, is it reckless for someone to maybe have 
been tested and, and gotten a false positive or maybe they outright know that they have it, but they've never had symptoms. Is it against the law or reckless endangerment to be having sex knowing you have it and not telling your partners? It is. And in not all states is it illegal, but in many states it is. Um, I've been involved in lots and lots of lawsuits, one person suing another about giving them herpes. And in some states, it's a crime, in others it's not, but it can be battery or other things. And um, I worked on a case in Portland of a woman, it it was in the news so I can talk about it, but um, she had sex with this man. He rolled off of her, she said to me, and said, oh, by the way, I have herpes. He had agreed to use a condom. She thought that he had, but it turned out he hadn't, and she got it. Mm -hmm. And she sued him and won $990,000. Wow. Took his medical practice, dental practice. So I think so, it's, so, it's, it's not just a, a moral obligation. I think if you don't disclose, you're putting yourself in a tenuous legal situation, depending upon who you're with and how they view it and did they get it. I mean, you, you've seen probably in the news about people, Usher and Robin Williams. I mean, these, these mm-hmm. are sort of public information, but I think it's something to think about. I think the con- okay. controversial one, I don't think disclosing HSV2 is controversial at all. I think it needs to happen. The yeah. controversial one is HSV1. So if you get cold sores, do you, should you tell everyone before you kiss them? And mm. I, I don't have an answer, but I have the answer <laughs> that before you give them oral sex, I think you should disclose. Right, because now we're seeing it being transferred. Genital to genital <laughs> HSV1 transmission is rare. And genital type 1 infection is only shed on a very few percentage days out of the year. So genital to genital transmission of 1 is really low. If people disclose, it's not about transmission, it's about trust. What if a relationship Mm. becomes more solid? You know, you start it's kind of just fun and friends with benefits or whatever. But what if that becomes more serious and you've not disclosed this? That's when I think it gets a little sticky. Right. And, you know, with all the stats we've been talking about here, you know, 50%, almost 50% with HSV1, and you said 12% with HSV2, at what point is everybody going to have it? Are we rounding that out? Or are there some people who are, like, immune to it? Or is, is it just a matter of time? No, I don't think it's a matter of time before everybody gets it. In fact, the numbers for HSV1 and 2 are going down. Some mathematical modeling has been done, though, and the mathematical model looks like it will come back up again, but right now it's definitely coming down. And one of the reasons we see an increase in HSV-1 genital infection is that parents have become aware that cold sores are herpes and are not kissing their children when they have a cold sore. Okay, so we have this whole group of kids entering their sexual maturity with no antibody to type 1. Their first exposure is they receive oral sex and they get it genitally. And is it true that you can also pass it from if your mom has it and uh, she's pregnant with you and when she, she if she vaginally births you, you can like catch it on the way out? <laughs> that is true. And that's certainly the probably the biggest concern about herpes, genital herpes, is, is maternal to fetal transmission. That's not common. There might, and it's mm-hmm. difficult to know exactly how many cases because of the coding issues associated with this. But there's probably 1,500 to 2,500 cases a year of maternal mm-hmm. to fetal transmission, and that is not mostly women who have herpes that give it to their baby. Women with established herpes. It's women who don't know they have herpes. No one's testing them. Or, and the particularly risky one is the woman who just gets genital herpes. So she has Mm -hmm. late in her pregnancy, her immune system is challenged, so her ability to make her own immune response is limited. People shed the most in the first six months of having herpes. She may not even know it or may have confused it with something else like a yeast infection. So she's, Mm -hmm. you know, 36 weeks along, she delivers, she gets herpes, she's 40 weeks along, she's shedding like crazy, she's not been able to develop an immune response and pass that to her baby. So that baby is at highest risk. Wow. Okay. So you also mentioned the the immune system changing. I've read that for some people, let's talk like first outbreak. I've heard a few things. I've heard it can come under intense stress. So like that can be something that 
is a catalyst for for bringing it out or that it's like a really bad flu where your body feels very run down or it can be nothing at all. So the stress issue is comes into play with recurrences, not with first infection, mm. but with recurrences. With new infection, um, it can present with dramatic symptoms or it can present with no symptoms, especially the person who already has type one, they acquire type two. Because the immune response is so similar between type one and type two, the person who already has type one and gets type two may have zero symptoms or very minor symptoms and miss it all together. So um, I want to move on to some listener questions, if that's okay. We had an influx of uh, fan questions. Um, let's see. Uh, Lady Quance asked how to have sex with someone who has herpes and not get herpes. So if you're female... Uh, I think we talked briefly about this, have your partner use condoms and take daily antiviral medicine, which is not that expensive and is only activated in the presence of virus. People say, wow, taking medicine every day is this bad for my body. The thing is that this medicine is only activated when the virus is active. Otherwise, you just pee it out unchanged. So it's very wonderful that way. Um, so that's for a woman having sex with a man. A man having sex with a woman, condoms are not as protective. They're certainly useful. Daily antiviral medicine. Development of, of an awareness that an outbreak is coming is important. And it also turns out that disclosure reduces the risk of transmission. That's an interesting study by Dr. Anna Wald at the University of Washington. And that is probably, we don't know exactly why, but if I had to guess why that's useful, it's because if you feel symptoms of an outbreak coming, you can say, we're not going to have intercourse tonight because I feel this sensation. If you haven't disclosed, you might be more likely to go ahead and have sex. I mean, that might be a reason why disclosure turns out to be really important, that you can discuss this more realistically. So disclose, become aware of symptoms, daily antiviral medicine and condom use. You mentioned a feeling of symptoms. What do you mean by feeling? That's called a prodrome. And for some people, not everybody gets prodrome, maybe 50% of people get prodrome, but it's a feeling of kind of a crawling under the skin feeling. Oh. And it's the virus moving along the nerve. So that kind of prodromal symptom, some people get really sensitive to light. Um, for oral herpes, I know I get cold sores and so I get kind of a sensation in my temple that's kind of intense. Mm -hmm. Then I start my antiviral therapy and I don't get outbreaks anymore. Wow. So you can actually prevent the outbreak from happening, but that doesn't necessarily prevent the shedding? No, it doesn't prevent the shedding, but it can prevent an outbreak. So when I was on the lecture circuit going all over the world doing these lectures, it was like the last thing I wanted was a big old cold sore on my lip. When I, so I would, you know, be able to prevent that. And I think that's very, very useful, but that doesn't mean there isn't any shedding present. So in that scenario, would you then refrain from kissing a partner or okay or oral my husband or, yeah. also has hsv1 so it's not an issue great yeah we're just saying it we're just stigmatizing <laughs> so if if um but if you're having oral sex or kissing on someone who's uninfected remembering that the test misses 30 percent of infection so it may not be accurate um then i think that's probably a time to not be doing that if you're worried about it the other thing is oh. You could just go ahead and not worry so much about it and take the risk. It's not the end of the world. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that we need people contact me and say, oh, I've got to do all these things. And say, well, you don't have to do all these things. Well, shouldn't I do all these things? It's like, well, that's kind of up to you. If you're in a long-term mm -hmm. relationship, you may not want to be using condoms for the rest of your life. You may just start right. with condoms and then shift to just antiviral therapy. The interesting mm -hmm. thing that we know is that the longer an uninfected person is with an infected person, the less likely they are over time to become infected. Their immune system develops some sort of recognition. So it's not a given that when you're with someone with a purpose, you will get it. That's a great point. I think that um, the, the, uh, the it's up to you is also a really good point. Um, I forgot to ask this, but when you are diagnosed, we, we've seen it in movies where then that person needs to call the last, you know, 10 people that they slept with. But if we're seeing that you could have picked this up from your mother at birth, you know, do you really, do you need to call? 
Let's go back and say, if a baby picks up puppies, they're going to know it. The baby gets really mm-hmm. sick. I don't, in terms of calling everybody, because it's not curable, I think we're less inclined to call everybody. Mm-hmm. With, you know, with chlamydia or gonorrhea, um, you really need to call everybody because treatment is, is pretty simple, although there are sequelae. So you want to make sure that people get treated. With herpes, it's a little bit different. Um, I think that some people want to call people and let them know or say, did I get this from you? You should be tested. I'm positive and I had sex with you. Right. right. I don't think it's mandatory like it is with some of the bacterial STIs. Haley, Kenneth, Haley K. Denny wanted to know, um, where can you go to get tested for free? I work but don't have enough money for insurance. Some county STD clinics include herpes testing or will do it for you. Some Planned Parenthoods will do it for you. Um, you just have to check because it's not, as you already have said, included in the standard STI panel in, in every place. So you, mm-hmm. you, I would start with Planned Parenthood or your county STI clinic. Greg Sky Morning asked, for acne-prone folks, how do you tell the difference between genital acne in grown hairs and something nefarious? So herpes presents as a as water blisters, generally speaking. Lots of people get folliculitis in grown hairs or bacterially infected uh, hair follicles in the thighs or on the buttocks or in the genital area. Um, And that looks very different. That generally there'd be a hair coming out of the place where you get it. Um, And herpes blisters are clear. Water blisters are clear. They're not, pus doesn't come out of them. Generally speaking, herpes blisters don't have pus. I mean, some of them can get a little bit pussy, but I think if you can pop it like a pimple, then it's probably a pimple. But if it's blistered and then it ulcerates and then it scabs, scabs are concerning in the genital area. Not too many things cause scabs. And it, is it painful? It's usually tender, but not every single time, but generally tender. And the other thing is that herpes gets mixed up with UTIs, urinary tract infections in women sometimes. They have herpes lesions at the urethra, so when they pee, it really hurts badly. Mm-hmm. And because there may be some white cells in those lesions, the urine dip could be lightly positive. So they're treated with antibiotics. And then six months wow. later, they get another one. Only, you know, and the antibiotics, you take them for a week, and it's gone. Miraculous. Right. Only that isn't what was going on. It was a herpes lesion that was healing on its own. So we, mm-hmm. we at the clinic, when women presented with those kinds of symptoms, unless they had something grown on a culture previously, we would do a quick exam. Just pop up on the table, and let's make sure there's no lesion at the urethra. Got it. So that includes all of our questions from the fans that we have today. Terry, I want to say thank you so much. This has been so informative. I still have like millions of questions swirling around in my brain, but I know that you did write a book as well, which the title I love is The Good News About the Bad News, Herpes, Everything You Need to Know. So I do want to also plug that if listeners have more questions. That seems like a pretty awesome in-depth book book. Um, is there any place that our listeners can find you or your, your work that you'd like to shout out? Westoverheights.com. Uh, Westover Heights Clinic was our clinic and westoverheights.com is our website. There's a free handbook about herpes, 45 pages long on the website that anybody can have. So wow. I would encourage people to do reading. There's also a forum associated with that where they can ask questions. They can ask three, do three posts for $20. And within those posts, have as many questions as they like. And then also the American Sexual Health Association, I answer questions on there. And so those are two websites where people can get information. And then finally, about the Western blot. So Mm -hmm. we talked about low positives and the need to confirm those. And the herpes Western blot done at the University of Washington is the best test. We use that test to enter people into clinical trials. It's, It's just the gold standard. For sure. So if people want to do that, they can do a video conference with me through our website and I can get that test ordered for them. That's amazing. Um, I thank you again. I uh, want to also just 
put it out there one more last time that I think knowledge is power. And the more that you know, the less scary it can become, especially when you're eight into that age of entering sexual maturity and, and, and educating yourself at an early age, I think is, is, um, the best way to enter this. And it's not the end of the world. Would you agree? <laughs> it's not the end of the world. And if you encounter someone that has herpes and they tell you, I would encourage you not to run. It's so much harder to find a great partner than it is to deal with herpes. <laughs> it's much easier to find someone with herpes than a good partner for life. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Terry Warren. Uh, don't forget, listeners, you can rate this on iTunes at Confidently Insecure Podcast. You can send us an email at Confidently Insecure Podcast at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Confidently Pod. And we will see you next week. Bye.